On November 14, 1979, Atari engineer Jed Margolin proposed a new arcade game, which he called First Person Space War. He describes a game in which, quote, the player is assumed to be in the cockpit of a space fighter and is pitted against a similar fighter controlled by the computer. Also, two cabinets could be linked together. The game would have vector graphics, like Atari's Battlezone, which was in its final stages of development. The most important detail of the memo comes near the end. Quote, a tie-in with one of the space movies, such as Star Wars II, might be desirable. The project was greenlit, and development began in May of 1980 with the working title Warp Speed. Very little happened for a year and a half because the engineers assigned to the project were busy working on Battlezone, and then a cocktail cabinet version of Battlezone. It was not until July 1st, 1982 that a fateful agenda item hinted at the success story the game would become. That day's project notes mention that the team has begun, quote, working on conversion to Star Wars theme. A recognizable outline of the final game emerges in a September update, sketching the structure of its three levels. A dogfight, strafing runs on the surface of the Death Star, and the famous flight through the trench. So nearly three years later, Jed Margolin's project got what he envisioned for it, a movie tie-in. These documents come from the collection of Atari Coin-Op Division corporate records, held at the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. Last summer, I spent several days there searching the archives for interesting narratives, technical documents, concept art, memos, and other materials that might shed light on the process of sound and music development. This presentation is a preliminary tour through one of the more interesting threads I've uncovered within the Strong's extensive and well-documented collection, the process of adapting popular movies for the arcade. In the early 1980s, the Atari Corporation collaborated with several major studios to create both arcade and home console games based on popular franchises, resulting in both commercial successes, like Star Wars, and infamous failures, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Drawing on that archival research, this paper examines the process of sound development in Star Wars and two other Atari arcade titles, Return of the Jedi, 1983-84, and the cancelled Gremlins, 1984-85. Development documents from these projects reveal the challenges of creating blockbuster adaptations, including the process of acquiring and incorporating assets for art, sound, and music, the difficulty of designing gameplay sequences based on unfinished movies, which secretive studios refuse to screen in advance, and the competing interests and needs of the engineers, marketers, and movie studios involved. Before we get started, there are a few things to keep in mind when studying arcade games of the early and mid-1980s. First of all, hardware was king as both a regulative and enabling force. Engineers had to take the cost and availability of parts into account, and there is frequent discussion of building new games up from chipsets and control configurations developed for previous titles. Production and design decisions were also tailored to the arcade sales market, and Atari collected mountains of focus group data on the potential popularity and profitability of a given arcade cabinet yielding reams of archival material on the preferences and reactions of serious arcade gamers of the time. The centrality of technology and manufacturing could also be an asset. Arcade cabinets were custom-built for each game, allowing designers to create the ideal control scheme and to combine multiple programmable sound generators for its soundtrack. Due to the bespoke nature of these games, and the relative freedom from restrictions like cartridge memory capacity, the graphics and sound capabilities of most arcade games outpace what was available in contemporaneous home consoles. Let's return to 1983's Star Wars through the lens of its music and sound. One advertising flyer proclaims, quote, Star Wars features random music. A song will be repeated no more than once every seven minutes, in stereo, and the music is taken from the original Star Wars soundtrack. Now, there are at least two lies in this advertising copy. First, the music of Star Wars is anything but random. Perhaps that's why the word is in scare quotes. In practice, the game is underscored by a series of short, recognizable fragments of John Williams' soundtrack. Each theme lasts only 10 to 20 seconds, and contrary to the claim of randomness, they occur in precisely the same order each time, separated by several seconds of silence. There are even clear narrative correlates. The transition from the first stage of the game to the second, for instance, is underscored by the very same battle music that accompanies a squadron of X-Wings turning downwards to attack the Death Star in the film. 
Next, regarding the length of time, there is some degree of adaptive variability in the game. If a player takes longer to clear a given wave, they might hear a few more themes. But even the slowest playthrough of Star Wars takes only about three minutes. While the music may be lacking a bit from what it could be, the selection of dialogue reproduced from the movie is impressive for 1983. Star Wars is one of several Atari cabinets to use the Texas Instruments TMS-5220 sound chip. This chip allowed developers to digitize recorded speech, pausing to clean up the algorithm's many errors frame by frame. As one memo describes the system, quote, the sound quality is a little unnatural, but preserves some of the speaker's identity and expression. Through this grainy synthesis, Obi-Wan Kenobi advises the player. Use the force. Darth Vader growls menacingly. <laughs> the dialogue reacts to the player's performance. Taking a hit will sometimes cause Luke Skywalker to say, I'm hit, but not bad. Aren't you? See what you can do with it. And should the player make it through to the end of the game, they'll hear Han Solo give the all clear to take the shot that will destroy the Death Star. You're all clear, kid. An achievement that will be greeted with another appropriately timed, anything but random soundtrack sample from the film. Star Wars appeared in arcades in May 1983 a year in Atari's history that may sound familiar for other reasons. It kicked off what we now know as the great video game crash. Atari's E.T. the Extraterrestrial for the Atari 2600 famously flopped at Christmas 1982, and the ripple effects of that failure, along with numerous other factors, were felt across the company and the video game industry for the next several years. I have not yet found a direct reference to the crash in the coin-op division's documents, though it seems impossible that those events wouldn't have affected their actions in 1983 and 84. What's more, other sources point to layoffs, reorganizations, and a generally unhappy atmosphere within the company at the time. I'm going to look at two more movie adaptation games, one that was completed and one that was canceled. While I don't want to read these games entirely against the crash, it is an event that pokes out between the lines of many of the memos and documents circulating at the time. After the success of Star Wars, Atari quickly turned its attention towards a sequel, though they looked to the franchise's most recent installment to do so, adapting 1983's Return of the Jedi rather than The Empire Strikes Back, which they wouldn't get around to until 1985. As you can see, the game features a third-person isometric point of view rather than a first-person perspective, and it uses filled, sprite-based graphics rather than vector graphics. Like Star Wars, Atari's Return of the Jedi featured three phases based on scenes from the film. The player first controls Leia for a speeder bike chase in the forest. A combined second wave intercuts between Chewbacca in his commandeered Imperial Walker and Lando Calrissian in space, flying towards the Death Star and the Millennium Falcon. And a final wave in which Lando blows up the Death Star. Marketing copy focuses especially on the game's split wave feature in the second level, which mimics the cinematic intercutting between the action on the surface and out in space. The game's much discussed voice samples prime the player for those transitions. A moment before each shift in perspective, we hear Han, Leia, or Lando speak about the state of the mission. I have a really bad feeling about this. Return of the Jedi has perhaps the most documentation of any of the games I examined in the Strong Museum archives, at least in terms of sound. An October 1983 document lists the sound effects that were planned. A March 1984 memo to Lucasfilm gives an even more comprehensive list. The developers were clearly committed to reproducing the varied soundscape of the movie as closely as possible, rather than relying on generic laser, explosion, and engine sounds. The game would run on four Atari Pokey sound chips, which provide two sound channels each, and one TMS-5220 voice chip like Star Wars used. The team imagined a rich soundscape based on dozens of sounds and speech samples from the film, and there was concern that there would not be enough channels, a familiar challenge facing audio programmers in the 1980s. One issue was the idea of using continuous engine noises, such as the distinctive whine of the speeder bike engines. Combined with music, which would occupy at least two tracks, there wasn't much left for the game's many sound effects. Laser blasts, explosions, enemy speeder bikes and TIE fighters, and so forth. In the end, the developers mostly restricted music to the beginning and end of each level. With the exception of the Imperial March playing as the player flees the exploding Death Star at the end of the game, a strange soundtrack choice for the Rebels' moment of triumph. 
Presumably, this underscoring was possible only because there are no enemies in that sequence, only obstacles. Throughout the development process, Atari's team was in frequent contact with Lucasfilm. Their correspondence indicates the scope of the game's sonic ambitions, with long lists of quotations and detailed, unique sound effects. Atari made their first soundtrack requests in September 1983, asking for 42 lines of dialogue on quarter-inch reel-to-reel tape, ranging from plot-critical ah, exposition hurry. The fleet will be here any moment. to exclamations from supporting characters. Yes, even including... It's a trap! After their initial request, Atari would repeatedly ask for more sound and music. In March 1984, Atari wrote again, mentioning 18 lines of dialogue that were reproduced poorly on the tapes that Lucasfilm had previously sent, and requesting 14 new lines. An internal memo in March lists the progress on the game's sound production, noting the rough condition of many sounds. The Falcon sound is all wrong, while numerous sound effects need work or are too soft. The Star Wars theme, the memo notes, needs to be shortened by half, and numerous sounds based on the film were still missing from the game, despite plans for a field test in only a few days. Atari was also concerned with securing the rights to reproduce John Williams' music. Every status update from April to July of 1984 proclaims, still do not have rights to use music. Not to worry. All of this evidence points to a working method in which placeholder sounds were used before being filled in with samples from the films. Many of the marketing reviews and focus groups went out without full soundtracks. It also points to a gradual reduction in ambition, as the great majority of dialogue samples requested from Lucasfilm ended up being cut from the final game. Still, the list of sounds and quotes offers a fascinating glimpse at the team's brainstorming process. Along with providing access to video, audio, and music samples, Lucasfilm had the right to approve or suggest improvements to the game. One of the most amusing details from this collaborative process is a memo from late in the development. Quote, Ewoks are part of the rebel forces and are players' friends, wrote two Lucasfilm executives in an April 1984 letter about the apparently mischievous antics of the game's original Ewoks. They must be more consistent with the role in the film. They are the player's ally and should not cheer when the player gets caught in traps. Atari responded, quote, We will try to overcome any potential misinterpretation of the Ewok characters by using apologetic Ewok phrases if the player is unintentionally victimized. Would this be acceptable? One of the most interesting archival finds from my trip to Rochester comes from another handwritten note from October 1983. This one reveals that there was a second Jedi title in the works at Atari. While the arcade game that eventually was released is referred to as the Digital Jedi, there is also talk of a video disc Jedi that sounds like it would follow in the footsteps of the influential Dragon's Lair, which had been released earlier that year. This game would be, quote, strictly a speeder bike sequence, with a fancy cabinet with molded speeder bike and a large projection screen. We can imagine what this game might have looked like, a reaction time based reenactment of the sequence from the film with footage from the movie and directional cues for avoiding trees and other obstacles. While the memo notes that, quote, the deal to get Jedi footage for video disc game is finalized with Spielberg, the document also recommends canceling the game, noting that others in the company did not want to produce two games based on the same movie. In my research, I have been able to find no other references to this game, and so far as I can tell, it is never mentioned on the many Atari enthusiast websites, so this other version of Return of the Jedi remains a mystery. The cancellation of that Dragon's Lair style speeder bike game brings us to our final topic, when these projects fail. I'd like to end by discussing a project that was never completed. In 1983, while they were developing Jedi, Atari was also working on an adaptation of the upcoming movie Gremlins, under the codename Gargoyles. Unlike Star Wars, a game that began speculatively with the hope of later attaching the name of a successful franchise, Gremlins was a licensed game from the outset. This Gargoyles summary offers a treatment of the movie's plot and proposes gameplay elements based on recognizable scenes and locations. A close reading of production documents from Gremlins reveals a troubled design process, and they show, among other things, just how far behind the rest of the development process sound design can sometimes lag. Much of that probably has to do with the place of sound effects and underscoring within the cinematic production process. Both tend to come very late in the timeline. 
To give a brief overview, the project was initiated on September 14, 1983. Recall this overlaps with Jedi. An early October meeting with Warner Brothers and Steven Spielberg's nascent Amblin Entertainment is said to have gone well, and the team left with production stills and a 16mm film reel of a gremlin walking for their reference. In November, Atari executives attended a marketing meeting with the studio. A memo circulated days later on the need for absolute secrecy on the project, hence the codename Gargoyles. While early interactions with Warner and Amblin were positive, production was difficult from the outset. An October 21st memo notes that the 3D graphics hardware the team was using, borrowed from the upcoming title iRobot, which was then nicknamed Ice World, wasn't working, and the company's engineers were spread too thin on more urgent projects to fix it. On November 7th, the team weighed the sunk cost of previous development time against the prospect of continued slow progress on buggy hardware that wasn't right for the game at hand. On November 23rd, they switched to a chipset called Faster Raster, Atari's next generation of 2D hardware, which would go on to power Paperboy in 1985. Staff members being unavailable due to other projects would become a theme for Gremlins. The team's sound programmer, Cynthia Petroka, was working on both Return of the Jedi in 1984, as well as an upcoming 1985 Roadrunner game based on the Looney Tunes franchise. On March 16th, a memo notes, quote, we are still waiting on a music and sound effects tape from Warner. We understand that the final music has not been recorded yet. The development team did not receive a tape of sound effects from the film until May 25th. The movie's release date, June 8th, 1984, came and went. A widely panned Gremlins game for the Atari 2600, developed by a separate team, was released on time. The Gremlins team lost lead programmer Franz Lanzinger, who resigned from the company in July, citing Atari's financial woes. Perhaps because of this, production continued well past the summer, into the spring of 1985. A spring 1985 focus group was postponed more than two months from mid-March to late May, and while a memo immediately after the meeting notes that the results were better than expected, a Kurt project cancellation memo came down on June 14, 1985. While Gremlins was never finished, some prototype footage does exist. It was recently digitized and put online by AtariGames.com and has been publicized and written about by video game historian Frank Cifaldi. Those who want to know more about the Gremlins project can also consult a video essay made by an archivist at the Strong Museum of Play. Link in the description of this video. I'll finish today by offering some brief thoughts on what we can learn from an archive like this and from analyzing movie tie-in games. First, many licensed titles began that way from the outset, tied to an upcoming Hollywood blockbuster, or at least a property that everyone hoped would be a blockbuster. While early communication and licensing aided in their development, having a property attached does not ensure success on its own, as we saw with Gremlins. And some titles, like Star Wars, can even become successful when they do not start out with a license and are converted to support a new franchise only late in their development. In looking through the archives, though, it's clear that even beyond adaptations, many Atari arcade titles began as gameplay concepts, which only later had themes attached. Another thing we learned from these documents is the relatively solitary and speculative life of the audio programmer. All of the memos I've read about these games indicate that soundtracks were constantly preliminary. Early builds of a licensed game were filled with placeholder sound effects, and games often went far into their development cycles, past numerous focus groups and marketing reviews, without either music or sound. Whether these delays in sound design contribute to project delays, such as the long and ultimately doomed development cycle for Gremlins, remains to be seen, but an image emerges that often places audio on the periphery of the game design process, beyond periodic updates that audio development is proceeding on schedule, or sometimes that audio development is not happening at all. I'm heartened, however, that there are also examples like Return of the Jedi, for which the developers seem to have let their sonic imaginations run wild, striving to recreate the cinematic experience as fully as possible. And I am heartened as well 
that through the many stories contained within archives like The Strong, and through the efforts of archivists and researchers from many disciplines of game studies, there seem to be many, many more behind-the-scenes stories to be told about the process of film adaptation, of arcade development in general, and of sound and music programming in particular.